Welcome back. Some say Korea is a digital pace setter, as it is perhaps the world's most connected country. Well, the truth is South Korea is indeed quite advanced in terms of mobile connection, which is remarkably fast and reliable with quite a few options available. For more on this reality, I have Andres Sanchez-Brown from EFE Spain. Andres, welcome back. Always a pleasure to be here. I also have Alexander Anastasov at Phone Arena live on the line. Alexander, it's a pleasure to have you with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Right. Andres, in April 2019, South Korea became the first country to adopt 5G nationwide. Now, that being said, let's start off with where South Korea stands in terms of mobile connection with regard to it, as compared to that is its global counterparts. Well, actually, you just pointed it out. Korea was the first country um, in 2019 to actually have a countrywide um, um, operative um, 5G network. And I think that actually tells you where the network already stands. From the beginning, I, I believe it was 85 cities from the start, from the, um, uh, when, the, when the system started operating. You could use 5G already in 85 cities. You could use it in motorways. You could use it on the KTX. That was three years ago. Now, um, obviously, all um, new um, and more advanced equipment has been installed. Uh, networks are, are, are stronger. So actually, if you check, uh, let's say, joint uh, studies or surveys, um, Korea's network, uh, compared to other countries' networks, normally ends up first in most categories. For example, uh, let's say if you compare it to the rest of uh, Asia-Pacific uh, countries' networks when it comes to downloading, uh, uploading content, video streaming, uh, e-gaming, Korea basically ranks first in almost every category. And when it doesn't, for example, um, some networks that are apparently um, starting to uh, grow faster are, for example, Malaysia's, but there's a catch there too. Because, for example, uh, the country has just started offering real 5G speed this year, even though the technology was present, uh, the full spectrum wasn't being used. And also their networks, of course, have uh, way less users compared to Korea, where, you know, the number of users is in the millions right now, of course. Right. And staying with that, Alexander, according to industry findings, there were reportedly over 22 million 5G subscribers here in South Korea as of the end of March this year. What do you believe are the implications of this particular reality? Well, I think we're still at the point in time where 5G is, has a sense of novelty to it. Uh, but I think much like 4G with time, that will disappear and it will become the standard and people won't even talk about it that much. So let's say the number that you said is approximately half of South Korea's population. And by 2025, that number even is supposed to increase to even 60 percent, somewhere close to 60 percent. And um, by that speed, uh, I think Korea will be one of the first countries where it becomes a standard, so much so that maybe phone manufacturers don't need to market 5G on their phone packaging or even their phone name. Right, and talking about packaging, South Korea, Andres, is now offering an affordable 5G price plan of between 50,000 won to around uh, 60,000 won per month to those who use less data. Um, how does this price plan compare to that in Spain for access, of course, to 5G services? That's actually a very good question if, you know, we want to gauge what uh, what actually the, the, the Korean 5G network is about and what it's actually capable of offering you as a, as a user, as a customer. Um, because actually, um, for example, in Spain, you have, let's say, five or six carriers are already offering 5G services. And actually, they're offering unlimited data, unlimited calls, and they're offering this for, let's say, price tags that go around 30 to 32, 33 euros, which is actually 42,001. It's actually cheaper. But then again, there's a catch. Uh, once again, uh, Spain's network, even though officially started operating in 2019, let's say a couple of months after Korea's network um, started, uh, the actual spectrum, the actual speeds that users have been able to enjoy are nothing compared to what you get in Korea. So, for example, you would be paying this lower price tag, but then most of these operators can only guarantee service in two or three provinces. Because uh, in, that, in that respect, I believe it's only 80% of Spanish population that has access to full 5G service. I mean, uh, up until recently, I believe only like 20 big cities in Spain had actual 5G uh, real speed services. So what you're going to get here is 
yeah, you might get a, a big, uh, a good deal, right, in, in, in monetary terms. But then again, when it comes to reliability of the network, uh, I mean, I think in that sense, Korea is unbeatable. You're getting, you know, uh, what you're paying for. Right, I see. And Alexander, staying with that, what can you tell us about the 5G price plan over in Bulgaria? Well, actually, the situation is kind of similar to that in Spain. Um, you get 5G no matter the plan that you choose and no matter the carrier. So the plus side to that is that you have 5G even if you have the cheapest, the most affordable plan. But uh, there, there's two caveats to this. First of all, of course, you need to have a 5G phone. Uh, but second of all, uh, our coverage is not that good across the country. Uh, you basically have to be in one of the few major cities if you want to catch 5G. And even then, when you have 5G, you don't get the full spectrum, the full speed. Right, I see. And Andres, before we move beyond 5G, many claim, like I mentioned at the start, that South Korea is the most wired country in the world. What do you suppose has made this particular status possible? Well, actually, I mean, uh, since, um, you know, recovering democracy, uh, Korean governments actually have been investing heavily in anything that had to do with uh, telecommunications, right? Um, you might remember back in the 80s, uh, uh, systems like government services were computerized pretty fast. Uh, then there was the push for uh, um, installing fiber, for example, which was um, done earlier than other countries in comparison. Uh, there were bills passed, for example, in the late 90s in order to avoid monopolies when it came to um, uh, facilitating internet service. So, of course, that guaranteed, uh, you know, healthy competition among two, three, four major carriers of the, and this, and this we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, LAN connections back in the day. Um, uh, this guaranteed, uh, you know, uh, fair price tags when you wanted to con get, get connected to the internet. And I remember by the mid thousands, I was living still in Spain and I remember doing a story about e-gaming in Korea because e-gaming was just very nascent back in the day in Spain but here in Korea I remember talking to uh, um, an e-sports athlete a Spanish one that had attended an event in Korea and he was telling me all about this completely different world where everybody was playing uh, at 24 7 competitions were huge uh, players were already famous and uh, so basically when you know when 3g technology uh, starts becoming available of course uh, and then smartphones Korea is an early user of both technologies people just you know want to keep uh, connected wirelessly so in the end you have generations of Koreans that have grown accustomed to being connected wherever and whenever uh, they are right right we are very used to that of course mm -hmm. now Alexander while 5g has yet to take root in many parts of the world the term 6g is making quite a bit of local headlines here what can you tell us about 6g i mean how does it compare to 5g and how soon can we expect 6g in the market well first of all i think it's important to point out that 6g is uh, still a concept it's not in fact reality yet uh, but that being said uh, most researchers agree that maybe we should see 6g by 2030 uh, and the way it would be differentiated from 5G, of course, would be, first of all, speed, which should be much, much higher than even that of 5G. And keep in mind that we still haven't completely utilized 5G and what it can achieve. Uh, but apart from speed, uh, it could also boost innovations like edge computing, for example, or stuff like virtual reality, augmented reality. Right. Andres, South Korea for its part has said that a pilot 6G will be available in the year 2026 and be commercialized between 2028 and 2030, as um, Alexander has mentioned. What more can you tell us about South Korea's advances in the field of 6G? Well, actually, uh, uh, this plan was actually announced in my country during the Mobile uh, World Congress in Barcelona. Um, the Ministry of Science made a, a big announcement and, uh, you know, uh, announcing that Korea once again wanted to be the first country in the world to implement it on a national level. Um, and uh, as Alexander pointed out, the plan is, you know, this is still a concept, but the idea behind this is that 6G would be, um, I think the ministry was talking about 50 times um, faster than 
5G's potential. So basically we're talking almost about you know uh, zero latency, what is called, which is the time that a data package or data bundle takes from one point to another. Um, they're talking about making the network um, available when you're like 10 kilometers above the ground, which basically means that you could use this in a commercial airplane. They're talk there's been a, a, a lot of talk, but what is Korea doing? Uh, well, for example, um, there's there's been a, a bunch of MOUs, for example, signed with uh, countries like the U.S. or Finland or the U.K. There's there's a lot of uh, joint research, but most importantly, um, the government is actually willing to invest in these key technologies, key technologies that would give you would make you be able to set the standards to get the patents and of course the government wants to invest in this case because you know companies find it, it it's actually a, a very risky investment at this point uh, so there's for example there's a 10 billion one program uh, where there's this uh, public private joint research uh, programs for example with KAIST and LG there's a uh, there's another one where Samsung Electronic uh, Electronics partnered with um, uh, Koryode you know there's uh, there's a uh, there's six focus areas already uh, been established of um, when it comes to uh, R&D and then one area where we've actually seen a lot of investment already and that is becoming a reality is uh, satellites uh, as you might remember you um, we, uh, we, we saw the Nudie rocket uh, deploying its first satellite in June. Uh, well, you know, the plan is that future Nudie rockets will deploy all these satellites that will be, you know, the future network of uh, 6G communications. Right. Alexander, what is your assessment of Korea's advances, so to speak, and what are some of the country's strengths, perhaps, over its global counterparts? Oh, first of all, Korea is known to be highly focused on advanced technology in general, but of course, especially mobile networks as well. So I think I think it's no coincidence that one of the first widely adopted countries, 5G countries, uh, was South Korea, and I think it would be kind of the similar a similar situation with 6G as well. Um, also, not to mention that many of the parties that are actively researching the sixth generation of mobile network are situated in Korea, like Samsung, for example. Right, it is. Andres, on a more practical note then, for the sake of our foreign viewers, what can you share with us about choosing a network and a phone plan here in the country? Well, that's actually a very good question, I think, and, and foreign viewers are probably going to be very um, interested. Um, I, actually, I happen to be an early user of 5G because, of course, also job requirements. Um, and uh, I'm not going to say the name of the carrier that I chose. I already had a contract with them. Um, and I actually um, chose to uh, acquire a, a new phone. As Alexander pointed out, you do need a 5G uh, phone, a, a phone that supports 5G to use the network. Um, and uh, I can say that the price of, uh, is very competitive. I'm very happy with my plan. I actually have two phone lines. One of them has unlimited 5G data. I have internet uh, and uh, cable TV bundled all together. And I got to say the price is extremely competitive. It is around, uh, let's say, 100,000, 120,000 won per month. That would be- For both uh, your phones? For both my phones and my internet and my uh, cable TV. Um, so I'm, I'm actually very happy with it. And I'm mostly happy because 5G uh, changed the way I work, for example, with video, especially. The, I can literally shoot, edit on my phone and send from anywhere I want. And I can send um, huge amounts of video in very, very little time. This is actually very impressive compared to what 4G was capable of doing. I can actually do a live TV stand-up uh, right now, basically using only my phone. So in that, in, in that sense, it's, uh, it's actually very, uh, very incredible. Right, well. and which is why you're very happy with it. Alexander, back on the 6G front, some pundits have spoken about a number of challenges to be tackled in the development of 6G network. Do you care to elaborate? Well, I think 6G carries the same kind of major hurdle as 5G, which is, um, I mean, it, it has millimeter waves, uh, which are the main reason uh, why it's so fast and it can transfer so much data in such little time. But that also means that it carries the same... Um, the same um, hurdle that um, this connection can be easily interrupted 
just due to due to uh, the way it works. And to me, uh, the what, the thing that would differentiate 6G from 5G is if we find a way to overcome this hurdle and make it more a more stable connection while also keeping the amazing speeds that it brings. Right. And staying with that, Andres, what are some areas that can be better addressed by relevant authorities here, perhaps, to ensure a safe and productive mobile experience? Well, I am no engineer, so of course on, on the technical side there's uh, very little that I can share with you. But that said, and as um, Alexander was pointing out, um, the, 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 prob the potential problems with 6G uh, is basically stability of the network. And the thing here is that if we are actually to use in the future the full potential of 6G, and that is, for example, uh, the real Internet of Things, we will see um, apparently, you know, uh, all sorts of devices connected between them, but also uh, maybe uh, drones, maybe uh, uh, self-driven cars, maybe even flying taxis. Of course, in, in this case, I think addressing safety uh, and, I mean, the stability of the network is basic there because, you know, security of passengers, for example, people walking in the street, uh, I would say should be uh, the number one um, priority Priority right now, yes. Right, of course, I agree right there. Mm -hmm. Alexander, what is your outlook with regard to the future of the global telecommunications industry? To me, uh, I, think, I think we're at the cusp of making a significant jump in the way we handle tele telecommunication. Uh, so whether that that is 6G that um, and everything it might entail or some other innovation uh, like edge computing, for example, I think uh, right now there's some sense of uh, us reaching a point where something groundbreaking is about to arrive and happen. Um, and maybe that, that groundbreaking breaking thing can uh, push us into a new age or a new way of living. Right, I see. And, and staying with that, Andres, what is your outlook with regard to the future of mobile connection technology here in South Korea? I mean, what more can we do to ensure uh, safety, like you mentioned earlier? Well, as I said, I'm no engineer, uh, but I've, I, I can say that I've, dri uh, I've driven um, self-driving cars. I've, uh, I've uh, taken place in, I've uh, taken part, sorry, in, in um, um, programs uh, funded by the government uh, here in South Korea, here in South Korea uh, with self-driving technology. And I do know that, of course, uh, security is their main priority. Uh, technically, as I say, uh, it's very difficult for me to tell you what they should do. Uh, but I do know that they're definitely addressing these issues and that Korea wants to be uh, there in the forefront and when it comes to uh, Internet of Things in general, uh, augmented reality, uh, metaverse, etc. I mean, the, the, the stakes uh, are clear. I think the, the, this, um, it doesn't matter who's in power in Korea. I think that idea has been um, uh, pursued since uh, for the past three decades and the Korean government is, you know, pretty clear on where its bet is and uh, that it wants to make, you know, uh, future internet networks, uh, future mobile networks safe, faster and, you know, a reference for the rest of the world. Right. And staying with the concerns raised by Andres, Alexander, what can you tell us about the safety uh, measures in place in Bulgaria, perhaps to ensure, of course, uh, the safety of people as well as privacy concerns? Hey, I feel like we haven't really reached that point of 5G yet in Bulgaria. Uh, of course, carriers uh, have their standard uh, safety measures uh, and they make sure to let you know why, when you're signing a new plan. Uh, but um, the country hasn't taken any major actions towards that as of yet. Right, so there is room for improvement then? Definitely. Definitely. All right, Alexander, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts at this very early hour in Bulgaria. And Andres here in the studio, as always, thank you very much for your insights. Thanks for having us here. Thank you. Thank you.